Some years ago, an S-4 submarine sank off of the coast of Massachusetts. 40 sailors were trapped in a compartment with limited oxygen. It was during the time of Morse code. And the divers went down desperately trying to save their lives. And they coded this question. Is there any hope? The oxygen was depleting, depleting limited time left to deliver them. And they wanted to know, is there any hope? Uh, that's a question many people ask coming out of this previous year. Will the new year be any better? <laughs> Can I hope for a better day, a change of circumstances, an improvement in my lot, finances, relationships, health, and a myriad other questions. Because for many people, they were losing oxygen last year. The ability to breathe, the ability to to live life to its fullness. The question is, is there any hope? Then you look at the world in which we are now having to survive in. Even if your own personal circumstances may not be that bad, you may have raised the question, will things get any better? in our political discord, in our racial crisis, in our lack of civility, in our canceled culture, in our redefinition of humanity, will things get any better? And sometimes you don't even know who you can go and talk to because they may be as hopeless as you. Reminds me of the, the gentleman who was standing on the precipice of the bridge threatening to commit suicide. A 911 call that came in to the police. There's this man on the precipice and he's getting ready to jump to his death, do something. A police call was quickly dispatched. Came upon the man and said, Sir, stop, you don't have to do this. The man said, yes, I do. Life isn't worth living. He said, well, look, just look, give me five minutes to explain to you why you don't have to do this. Then I will give you five minutes to tell me after I've talked why you think it's still necessary for you to end it all. So just 10 minutes before you make this decision. He said, okay. The officer waxed eloquent, the meaning of life. Things can get better. The dignity, you know, he went on and on for his five minutes. The gentleman then took his five minutes to express why life was so empty. The policeman then reached out his hand. The man on the precipice reached out his hand and grabbed the policeman's hand. And they both jumped. Because <laughs> sometimes your hopelessness rubs off on others. And we see that today where people's pain is not only hurting them, but they're hurting other people. They don't mind damaging you to express how damaged they are. And so the question that we raise, or you know someone who does raise it, is will it get any better? Either for me, or for someone I know, or for the environment I'm in. Will it get any better?
better. Many people right now, as the clock struck midnight, find themselves living under an overcast sky. And all they see is rain and clouds. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. It just is the light of an oncoming train. Because all they see is a train wreck headed toward them. Such was the situation that Isaiah the prophet had to address. As he spoke to God's people who found themselves captive in Babylon. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you just need to know you are captive in Babylon. Because you are now living as part of the visiting team. You're part of the visiting team because we have lost home field advantage. The culture is no longer accepting of a Judeo-Christian worldview. It no longer values a biblical framework for life, decision-making, family, identity, living, resources. It has abandoned God, and yet this is where we are. And we all bear the repercussions of this foreign environment in which we now live to varying degrees. Isaiah is writing to people who find themselves in an unpleasant place. They don't want to be there. They don't want to live there. But they don't have an option to get out of there. They are stuck. In chapter 43, he writes them. Of course, he writes them in the whole book, but in chapter 43, he writes them a chapter worthy to be read this week in full, but I want to just call your attention to a couple of verses where he says to these people who are not happy with life right now. Verse 18 says, do not call to mind the former things or ponder things of the past. Behold, I will do something new. Amen. He says, you are in a bad place. I'm going to say something about that in a moment. And you look back at the former things and there are a lot of unpleasant memories. Perhaps some regrets or perhaps some things that you wish we're not part of this past year. Just three days ago, me and my family were together and we had to remember that this was the third anniversary of my wife's passing and the former things just show up. And they just don't make you feel that good. He says, you're not in the best place. But I don't want you to be controlled by yesterday. Because you can't change yesterday. He says, I don't want the former things to be your identity. Because I am doing something new. When the clock strikes midnight, people are looking for something new. That's why it's called New Year's. They want something new, something different, something better than what's before. Even if it was a decent year, you want something new. When many of you back out of your parking spaces, you will look in your rearview mirror because it will show you what's behind you. 
You need that rear view mirror as you back away. But on your way to your next destination, you will live in the windshield. On your way home, don't spend, please, too much time in your rear view mirror. Or you're going to hurt somebody. Because the rear view mirror is to be glanced at, not lived in. It is the windshield of where you're going that should dominate, not the rear view mirror where you've been. The people had abandoned God. God's people had walked away from God and had adopted idols, false gods. An idol is any noun, person, place, thing, or thought that you look to as your source. God was no longer their source while they carried on their religion. So they still went to church, they still raised their hand in the air like they just don't care. They still, they still did the religious thing, but after service was over, they went back to their idols. And as the result of their idolatry, God's judgment put them in the place where they were now captives to Babylon. They were looking at their situation and they were saying, woe is me. Look at what we did that put us where we are. If we hadn't done that, we wouldn't have this. And they were suffering from the disease of regret. And I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, can look back. Maybe it wasn't last year. It could have been the year before that or the year before that. And you look back and you say, if I hadn't been there, I wouldn't be here. If I hadn't done this, it wouldn't be that now. And so they find themselves in Babylon. They find themselves in an unpleasant state. They find themselves in a place they didn't want to be. And still God says, do not call to mind the former things. Don't let yesterday own you good, bad, or ugly. Don't be owned by the former things and don't spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about it, he says, or ponder things of the past. Behold. Now when the Bible says behold, that means behold. <laughs> means Stare at it. Pay attention to it. Don't miss it. Because if you're living in yesterday, you might miss what I'm doing today and where I'm taking you tomorrow. He says, behold, pay attention. Don't want you to miss this. I will do something new. Oh, okay, wait a minute. I will do it. I haven't done it yet. I will do. This new year, we have not seen it yet. We've just entered it. We don't know what the year is going to be. But he says, you better pay attention so you don't miss it. You better pay close attention to what I am doing because uh, if you don't pay attention, you'll miss something new and be stuck in something old. He says, behold, I will do something new. But wait a minute. We're in Babylon. We're in a bad state. We're in a place we don't prefer to be, even though it's our fault that we are here. And you want me just to act like this reality is not real? No. Because he tells them something very interesting in chapter 43, verse 14. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I sent you to Babylon. Ooh. Ooh. 
there is a benefit to Babylon. Oh my goodness. You mean in the place I am that I don't want to be, that it's my fault that I'm here, you still have a purpose in my pain? You still have a purpose in my problem? You still have a purpose in my predicament? You have a reason for this negative season? He says, for your benefit, I sent you into Babylon. So I want you to look at your pain through my eyes. Because I'm going to use your problem to do something new. I'm going to use your messed up situation to make you better. I'm going to use the place you don't want to be to let you see me in a way you've never seen me before. Because I'm going to show you something new. I'm going to show you something you have not seen before. What 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 what, what you gonna do, God? What's what what help me? What? Cause I don't wanna be here. I don't wanna be here mentally, relationally, circumstantially, economically, personally, racially, politically, socially, culturally. I don't wanna be here. You are here for your benefit. Even though you're going through a tough season, if you will behold, if you'll pay spiritual attention and look at it through new eyes, not just circumstantial eyes, but spiritual eyes. And the reason why I know he wants you to see it through spiritual eyes is all the names he gives himself beginning in verse 14. He says... I am the Lord, I am your Redeemer. He says, I am the Holy One of Israel. He then says, I am the Lord again in verse 15, your Holy One. He then goes on and says, I'm the Creator in verse 15, and I'm your King. I'm your Redeemer, I'm the Holy One, I'm the Creator. I'm your king. He says, you best pay attention to me. He says, if you want to make sense of the circumstance you don't prefer, you better pay close attention to me. The media is not going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. It's not going to show you what I'm going to show you. Television is not going to show you what you need to see. Reality TV ain't going to give you reality to your situation. You better remember the Lord, your Redeemer, your Creator, your King, because I'm the one doing something new. And I'm doing something new in a place you don't prefer to be. Well, well, well what you, what you going to do new? Well, how will I know? that you are doing something new in the place you sent me that I don't want to be that you said is to my benefit. Because we don't generally look at our pains as beneficial. Those are problems, difficulties, challenges. He said, I sent you to Babylon for your benefit. I want you to start looking for the benefit of Babylon. Once you start looking at it through the eyes of your Redeemer, your Lord, your Creator, your King, who is the Holy One. He then tells them what's going to be happening. They haven't seen it yet. I will show you something new. So in this new year, I want you to look for something new. Even though you may be in something old. <laughs> even though you may not be where you want to be. I want you to pay attention spiritually through spiritual eyes. And he says, this is what's going to happen. Behold, verse 19, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Bam. It's going to jump out at you. 
Will you not be aware of it? In other words, it could spring forth and you not see it. God could show it and you not be aware of it because you're so stuck in 22, you're missing what he's doing in 23. You're so stuck in the circumstance that you're missing what God is up to. Will you not be aware of it? And here is what I'm going to do. I will even make a roadway in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Uh, okay, okay. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. This will be one of the great restorations in the Old Testament. God is going to bring Cyrus from Persia. Cyrus from Persia. He talks about that earlier in chapter in the chapter, Cyrus from Persia is going to come and defeat Babylon. They're going to release the Jews to go back to their homeland. When they release the Jews from Babylon to go back to their homeland, they're going to have to go there through the Judean wilderness and desert. And it's just dry, parched land. Nothing to show there. He says, I am going to join you in your pain spot, Babylon. And I already have a plan that you don't know about, Cyrus. But they don't know about Cyrus yet because it hadn't happened yet. But I have a plan and I'm going to show you something new and it's going to come out of nowhere. It says it's going to spring up. In other words, you can't pre-predict it. You can't know how I'm going to do it, when I'm going to do it, where I'm going to do it because it's going to pop up. Gonna just pop up, you're gonna go, whoa, where did that come from? <laughs> but he says, if you're not beholding the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One, the Creator, you might miss the pop up. He says, it's gonna sp spring forth, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a road in the wilderness, and I'm going to give you water in the desert. Now, oh, hold it, don't miss that. I'm not getting rid of the wilderness. I'm not canceling the, the desert. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the trajectory of how you get from where you are to where you want to be, even if it's a dry environment in which you got to do it. I am going to carve a road in the wilderness and I'm going to pump a waterfall, a river in the desert. So you still may be surrounded by wilderness, you still may be surrounded by desert, but you're still going to be able to make the trip. And you're going to be able to make the trip because I am going to spring forth something you can't see now, but if you pay attention, when it pops up, you'll know I'm taking you from where you are to the next step of where I want you to be. So I want everybody to be looking up for the pop-up of God when he meets you in the pain of Babylon and he says that I'm going to take you from where you are to where I want you to be and even if you're still surrounded by negative realities of the wilderness and the desert, I don't want you to go your own path and miss the road I cut. I don't want you to go your own path and miss the river to refresh you. And he says, don't be dumber than the animals because he says the animals are not going to miss it. He says the jackals and the ostriches, he says they're going to see it. They're going to see what I provide in an environment. Don't be dumber than the animals. Don't let the animals see me work and my children miss me working because they're paying more attention than my people. They're paying more attention to what the Redeemer is doing. And he says, I will give water in the wilderness and I will give drink, watch this verse 20, to my chosen people. I'm not trying to solve the problem in the White House. I'm trying to get folks right in my house. I will solve it for my chosen people. And then he says, the people who I formed for myself will declare my praise. He says, I am going to do this, but I'm not first going to do this for you. I'm going to do this for me because I formed you for me. I formed you to give me glory, to give me praise. 
So let's back up. I brought you to Babylon because you were no longer praising me. You had gotten so secularized. You had gotten so, so uh, uh, stiff-necked. You, you, you had gotten so sedity that you didn't need me anymore. So I let the whole environment suck you up until you got to the point where you recognized you needed a redeemer. You needed a creator. You needed a Lord. You needed the Holy One. And now that I may have your undivided attention, because I sent you to Babylon for a purpose, I'm going to now release you to something new, but only if you're paying attention. And if you pay attention, and if you see what I'm doing, then I'm going to get what I should have gotten a long time ago. I'm going to get my praise. I'm going to get my praise. You didn't praise me then, but you're going to praise me now because I put you in a Babylonian situation, but you saw me cut a row in your circumstance. I am asking God in 2023 to give you a fresh reason to praise him, to give you a fresh reason to give him glory, to give him a fresh reason to lift up his name, to let you see how he cut through your negative situation, how he flowed through your pain, how he met you in your predicament, how he solved your problem, how he gave you hope in your hopelessness. But we ain't gonna wait to see the road. We're not gonna wait to see the river. We gonna praise him so we don't miss the road or miss the river. So let's begin to get ready now to get your praise on, to give him the glory to his name. I want you to wake up all week long and I want you to start your day saying, I want to praise your name. I want to lift your name up. I want to give you glory. I don't see it yet, but I'm sure looking for something new. I don't see it yet, but my eyes are open waiting to see what you're going to do in my bad situation. God is looking for some folk who will praise by faith and not by sight. I don't see it, but I'm going to praise it anyway. I don't see it fixed, but I know who the fixer is. I don't see it changed, but I know who the redeemer is. I don't see it created, but I know who the creator is. And since I don't want to miss it, I'm going to get my praise on. I'm going to praise you in the morning. I'm going to praise you at noontime. And I'm going to praise you when the sun go down. Heaven going to get tired of me because I'm going to give him the glory do his name. I'm not going to let the jackals out praise me. I'm not going to let the lions and the foxes out praise me. I'm going to give him praise because I need him when I face the wilderness of the new year. I want you to give him some glory today. And I want that to be 